All right. See. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's how I am too. But so, so give me the update. Like, like, how have your lives changed since I saw you in Minnesota? Because that's the last word I've had. <laughs> well, when was that even? I don't uh, know. The convergence, like three oh gosh, years so... ago. Oh my gosh, that was like four years ago. Four years ago. Yeah. So we're we're got five years under our belts. And we are start. This is our sixth year. Okay. Um, kind of hoping that we're following the bamboo growth pattern. Of, you know, <laughs> after five years, it just takes off, and you can't control it. So right, right. Start, start slow. Uh, yeah. You know, with uh, I've heard for perennials, they the first year they sleep, the second year they creep, and the third year they leap. That's what we had hoped for too. Yeah. But then we learned the story of bamboo, and it takes five years before bamboo takes off. So well, well, we did. We did kind of leap in year three. We, we did. Did I have a leap? Just wasn't as big of a leap as we wanted. Exactly. So now we're hoping for that bamboo leap. <laughs> no, we are doing so well, honestly. Now we don't have the money to really pay salaries, which is the problem. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Milton and I were just discussing. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I don't get paid anything. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I mean, I'm getting paid to do this, but uh, but yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, living wage. Yeah, I, I would. I wouldn't be able to live off of this. Um, right. It's. Uh, I, I'm. I'm experimenting a lot with the gift economy, and. Uh, uh, and, and just, I mean, just think of myself as an activist and, you know, yeah. building the stuff that needs to be there that, you know, that nobody's going to pay you to be, to build right. and, and we're going to desperately need it someday soon. And until that point, I mean, it just doesn't have a value, but we still need it. Right. No, no, no. It. it has a value. It's just not being, being valued. Uh, no. mon monetary value, culturally uh, ex accepted value. Exactly, yeah. a culture accepted value, correct. Wide oh. scale. The culture is building, because that's what's so fun now, because it's like when I first started doing this and we'd go out and we'd give talks, Yeah. Forget. we'd ask the audience, okay, so who's heard of permaculture? You know, maybe <laughs> you'd get one or two hands, but now it's like a good percentage of the audiences raise their hands, they've heard of it. That's huge in five years. Yeah. So, I mean, it's getting out there and, you know, the awareness is building. You know, of course, most people still just think of it as being a land management, you know, food growing thing. Gardening. Yeah, it's gardening, but at least they're aware of it. You know, it's on the radar. Yeah. So, progress. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So, so yeah. So, tell tell me, still, like, what what are you guys doing? Okay. Well, so we're kind of in a little bit of a transformation, yeah. but. Uh, we're really focused on building resiliency in people's suburban lives, okay? So how do we use permaculture to help people cultivate a resilient lifestyle, to cultivate a resilient landscape, and then a resilient community, right? And so we're kind of hitting those things in different spots through our education and through our outreach and community service. Uh, you know, so we teach classes, edible wild plants, permaculture, forest gardening, and herbalism are our primary courses, uh, mm -hmm. and then shin Shinjinyoku, forest therapy. So those are all ways people can be cultivating resilience within their lifestyle. And then we do our fruit tree guilds and our edible forest gardens throughout the communities, and that's a way that we're growing food security and we're building up the landscapes, right, to grow resilient landscapes, which is also part of growing a resilient community. And then Jody's been really involved with the food security kind of movement in DuPage County and then solar energy. Um, how do we get our cities to adopt sustainability plans uh, and goals? And, you know, so all of that kind of stuff, we're working on that. It's just a little here, a little here, a little here. And we're still, because it's just really the two of us, it's been a bit of a challenge to really develop each of those components. I mean, the education is solid. You know, we're good and solid on that. 
Right. And the Fruit Tree Guild stuff, we're developing new programming with that and the Forest Garden. Um, and then the third tier, the community thing, is just really kind of getting started, and we still have a lot of work to go building that. But anyway, that's kind of what we're focused on. Mm. Uh, so it's the Resiliency Institute? Correct. Right. And uh, Yeah, so, so that's all for the Resiliency Institute. That okay. we started in January, January 31st, 2013 is when we started that. Officially, that's when we got our, we started a little before that, but yeah, that's when we were officially a nonprofit. We were officially <laughs> a nonprofit, and then we did our first presentation in, what was it, late April, I think. Um, and so that's kind of how we kicked it all off. And that's where we've been really devoting the majority of our energy after our PDCs, because I just had finished my PDC yep. in January. Um, and so we just launched right into the Resiliency Institute after that. Yeah, because we were already, you know, we were already familiar with permaculture. We just right. took that next step of finally actually getting the certificate. Um, yeah, and then trying to help people bring it into their lives. And my passion is much more the lifestyle and the community, you know, aspect of it, the landscaping part. I like to just go forage. <laughs> uh, and I'd like to go plant in forests if I could, if everything wasn't privately owned. <laughs> so <frustrating>. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's one of those things we have to deal with, right? Yeah. Oh, it is so, I am dealing with that right now with all the forest preserves and all the permitting that's necessary for us to even take people on walks on public land that we pay for with our tax dollars. <laughs> they want us to pay them to take people on a walk in the forest. I'm just bewildered. Mm. I just don't get it. Yeah. So yeah, I'll talk about those invisible systems. So yeah, that's the interesting thing too. So, you know, it's like we did start here in the suburbs and that has been where we've really tried to maintain our focus because it is certainly a niche um, venue space to work in. You know, obviously, you know, there's the typical permaculturists who go off and do their, you know, 40 acres and do their own thing. And yeah, that's great. Have people, you know, come and learn from you. But we feel that being in the suburbs is critical because this is where all the consumption is. It's this system that has created all the disconnection and dysfunction of all of our systems that are existing. And this is where, you know, the real connections and redesign needs to really happen, mm -hmm. which is, you know, it's, it's exhausting, but, you know, it's like, this is where it, we really need a lot of people coming together uh, to work and, you know, transition these, you know, community systems. Um, yeah. And, and we believe that the way to affect change is to create an alternative that people are drawn to. So if we can create an alternative way of living and draw people to living in that way, then that's how we pull away from our current capitalistic economy and consumption and waste mm -hmm. uh, behaviors. So we just have to say, this is a great way to live. You know, I really, you really want to live this way. It's going to be so rewarding for you, not just in terms of economics, but rewarding for you in terms of health and happiness and well-being. Um, you know, when you're more connected with nature, when you're connected with where your food comes from, when you're more connected with your family, where you're prioritizing the things that really make you feel healthy and happy as a person, rather than what society is telling you you need to do to be happy and healthy. You know, so we really want to kind of create that shift to get people away from following the dogma of society um, and instead following more of the internal dogma. I guess. Mm. Getting more in connection with all of our human senses that we're trained in our society to turn off, which is where the Shinyan Yoka really comes into play is because that's exactly what that skill does is it develops that awareness of those intuitive and sensory awareness things that you know we're forced to turn off in our current society you know it's like everything is in your head your head your head maybe your vision but you know the rest of our senses are just completely shut off and 
people need to become aware of that. And then you can start to redesign your life according to things that are going to make you really happy and feel good. I, I'm kind of, I'm kind of curious, like how, how did taking a PDC kind of enable a shift in your lives from where you were before to after? Well, well, Go ahead, Michelle. Yeah. <laughs> Even though I had read so many books, right, about permaculture, and I was already a zero waste consultant, I was already doing the gardening component, you know what I mean? I was already doing a lot of parts. I hadn't, and, and I was a aromatherapist, a yoga instructor, you know what I mean? I had all the, the renewable energy, I had all the parts, right? I'd done everything, but it was all separate. And I, for me, the PDC just really unified everything into one system that made sense and made me understand, like, I wasn't crazy to have such a scattered interest, right? Like, okay, it's, it wasn't so off the wall to want to be into holistic healing and renewable energy and zero waste. And, you know, it wasn't crazy to do that because... I was seeing this bigger system of how they all fit together, but the PDC really like, aha, like this is it. I see it now. I understand how they all fit together and I understand how I need to weave them into each other. And so it's that whole spider web, you know, the, the spider web of how it's all connected. That's what the PDC did to me. I mean, it was, Seriously, it was eye opening, eye awakening, spiritually awakening, like wow. So I had all the information already. I already had the knowledge, but it connected. It, it's, it's how you put it together. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because yeah, when it's separate, separate bubbles, they don't connect, they don't they don't uh, 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 synergize. Yeah. Exactly. It, yeah, and, and then the idea that yeah, to put it all together to, you know, the, the broma therapy influences how you go about your day, yeah. right? And whether, you know, what state you're in and then how you can do... Infect other people. Infect other people and, and how you work in the community and, yeah. you know, whether you have the energy to go garden and after, you know, a long day of working and, I mean, also all sorts of stuff, right? Right, yeah. And that's just exactly. one little piece. Right. How about you, Jody? Uh, ditto, exactly <laughs> what Michelle just said. So, well, that's that's why you know it's like I went and I took my B, my PDC in July, and you know it was the same thing. You know I'd learned about it you know years before, and you know done all the YouTubing, book reading, you know, and it's just like okay, finally I went and took my PDC, and I was like. I'm like, okay, sitting through the whole thing, I'm like, all right. The whole time I was there, I'm like, okay, how am I going to bring this back to where I live? Yeah. You know, it's like, okay, this has to be brought to the suburbs. You know, it's like, this is where the work needs to be done. The entire time I'm sitting through the, the course, I'm like, okay, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? And I'm like, it just has to be done. This is what I have to do. Because, yes, the permaculture course, it, it gives you the framework and the tools to – see things and, you know, work with things so that you can exactly, like you said, synergize them. So that's when I went back and I'm like, okay, Michelle, <laughs> we have to do this. Um, go take your PDC and see if you're willing to do this. And she's like, okay. So she went and she took her PDC and, you know, this is just a couple months later and she's like, okay, let's do it. <laughs> and, and we did it. So, um, because our, you know, it was the same thing. Our paths had crossed several times, you know, cause we're doing the same kind of work, mm -hmm. you know, doing the community work. And it's like, okay, oh yeah. Now I know why our paths keep crossing. And why, right. you know, we keep showing up in each other's life because, um, you know, we have the same interest and we get it. And I'm like, okay, well, Michelle is about the only person I really know who truly understands, you know, where things are at in our community and, you know, what needs to be done. So, so we did it. And here we are. <laughs> We're doing it. Doing it. Indeed. Uh, let's see. What, what else? What else can we pull out of this? What, what we'll grow into? Um, 
Well, you know, our organization, when we started, like Jody said, people really didn't have a clue what permaculture was. Between all of the work we've done, all the marketing we've done, all the press we've received, um, we have really made permaculture a part of the vocabulary mm -hmm. of our suburban Chicago area. Um, and, and even, I think, inspired other people to begin organizations or to begin projects um, that mm -hmm. are similar to what we've done. You know, so they've come to see our edible forest garden at McDonald's Farm. And you know, we've had several tours of that. And then people have been inspired to go actually and start a project in their own community or in their own yards. Um, you know, Evanston now has started a food forest. Yep. Um, you know, in Aurora. In, uh huh. Aurora. 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 Yeah. And They're popping up. They're uh, just, more and just, more. Just so I have the. You know, um, t tell me about the, the farm and the food forest there, just so I can, you know, I got to come up with some bullet points like, oh, they have this food forest at, you know, for how many years at this place? Yeah, go ahead, and, yeah. you know, I got to, I got I to, gotta, I, gotta, I gotta say something about what you've done. <laughs> right. Yeah, I and, I, and I don't know enough to just make it up. Well, I'll have to give you the numbers. I don't have the numbers too, but before we get okay. into the food forest, I can give you, I'll email to you the number of graduates we have because we have, you know, like 20 something graduates of edible wild plants and 20 something of, of herbalism and we'll have 20, is this your second or third year with permaculture, Joy? Uh, second. Second. So it'll be almost 30. Almost 30 people from the permaculture forest guard. So we can give you kind of some stats Plus on our two permaculture design courses, our beekeeping course. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And um, stats. yeah. Yeah. So I can give you some stats about like graduates of all of our courses. Yeah. How, how long how long has the food forest been? It's at McDonald Farm. Yeah. So at McDonald Farm, we began installing that project. We did the sheet mulching um, in 2013. So the fall of 2013, okay. we sheet mulched the whole thing. And then in the spring of 2014, we sheet mulched it all again <laughs> and put <laughs> in the trees. Yeah. And um, But we had to do a lot of site work. Yeah, mm -hmm. there was a lot, a lot of, of site work because it was a mess. <laughs> so, yes, uh, a lot of learning has gone into the projects we've done. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, we began with the trees and the shrubs, um, and then we, you know, continue to add layers and add plants as we've gone along, and we're still adding to that. Always, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, but yeah, it was the swale. So we did the earthworks um, of 2013. We did the earthworks and the sheet mulching. So okay. we put in the swale system, the hugel culture beds, um, and then we started planting that following spring. And uh, it was that fall when we began our fairy forest garden project. And that's about a third of an acre. It's on DuPage County property um, mm. along the Illinois Prairie Path um, on the north side of Naperville. So that, um, so that one we sheet mulched in 2014 in the fall and then began um, planting the following spring. Um, and they've been, you know, again, growing and adding ever since. So just working to build community around both projects, both, th both those projects we did, um, we knew it was not done in the ideal permaculture design mm -hmm. process, mm -hmm. because when you start with a permaculture design, you obviously start with the people, um, you know, it's a community project. So, you know, you work with the community, get the community involved and invested first, which we didn't have the luxury of doing because we just really needed to get things in the ground and growing so that people could actually have a visualization of yeah. what we're talking about when we say a forest garden. Well, which which comes first, you know? Right? Exactly. Like, so their forest garden, like yeah. So it's but you know, so we work to build you know our community as we've gone along. So you know, it's like everything's been done with volunteers. So it is all you know volunteer based, and you know it, people show up. You know, it's like say we're gonna have a permablitz, people show up, and um, so it's 
it's growing, it's coming along. Um, those are our main two projects. And then we also did, what? They're amazing projects now. I mean, it's taken, it takes a while for, for you know, for us to really become something. Oh, you know? yeah. Yeah, but, it does. Um, and it's, it's a great. the most challenging thing we have to deal with as permaculturists is that small, slow solutions principle. <laughs> you know, it's like, this is what happens when you don't follow it. You know, when you go and you start an entire forest garden without your community, when you don't follow that process. But as it's evolved in a slow process, the communities come along and, right, you know, right. it's growing and building. So when you follow the principle, it works. Um, but as permaculturists, we know, no, we want it done right now. Hurry up. And <laughs> no, we go big. Um, so, yeah, it's just that kind of, that continuous, you know, reminder that, nope, you've got to follow that principle. Um, so it's coming along. You know, we've done uh, – so when we first started, this was interesting. So Northern Illinois Food Bank, they approached us, and they wanted to transition their entire property into, you know, a forest <laughs> garden. Um, mind you, it wasn't a ton of land because most of the land was a building. So mm -hmm. it was just these awkward kind of – around. think of a typical industrial park building. You know, it's got some swales and a retention pond. And, you know, the little bits of land that are around it. So we put together a design for, you know, one of the main areas in front of the building. And, of course, by the time you accommodate those invisible structures of having to meet ADA accessibility and all the public, you know, liability type issues and things, you're looking at a $90,000 project for, I don't even remember how big that space was, Michelle, do you? Was it? An acre? 65 feet long. Was that about how long it was? Yeah, I can't remember. But, you know, for this, not a giant project. And so, of course, the food bank is not going to spend $90,000 on, you know, that type of project. So we went and we um, we just did a fruit tree guild. So there's a demonstration fruit tree guild mm. that we put right in the front so that people can learn from it. And then as they've gone along, going back to small, slow solutions, they've incorporated other food growing methods into various parts of the property slowly, you know, right. as they've got the time and the resources to manage it. Um, you know, the Fruit Tree Guild is there. And so that's yeah, a big one, but it's a learning opportunity for all of their network partners. You know, so all these other food banks and, you know, or food pantries and churches, places that actually use the facility. Um, you know, they've got over seven, 600 and some entities that, you know, they support. So mm -hmm. it's got so the potential to impact a lot of places. Right. So, yeah. We had designed a program where we were going to educate their program partners about um, nutrition and food forests and, and local food and all that kind of stuff. And then, but, and then assess each of those for the option of having a fruit tree guild on their site. Cause a lot of times, like Jody said, the sites are not really conducive, you know what I mean? Yeah. Because they're kind of in a strip mall maybe, or, you know, wherever, and then they don't really have the land. Um, but we yeah. really wanted to get the, all the different food banks to have at least a fruit tree guild mm -hmm. as a way to demonstrate that food doesn't come from a food bank or a grocery store, but food actually comes from plants and trees. So we just wanted a visual reminder for people to see that. Mm. Or it's also a way, you know, people could see it. And, you know, if they live in an apartment complex, you know, they could go back and approach the management and say, you know, can we do this on our property here? Um, because it's, you know, it's a manageable thing. And once you get it up and established and running, you know, it's not like an annual garden or community gardens that, you know, typically get run over with weeds because, you know, it requires a lot of, you know, maintenance to keep them, you know, weed free, if you're growing annuals, you know, a fruit tree guild, you can grow like any perennial garden and it can be maintained very similarly to a lot of the landscaping that's already existing on properties. Right. Fits right in. Exactly. Um, so that's what we did this year too, is we really focused on, so we finally, mm -hmm. which is something we've been wanting to do since we began, put together our fruit tree guilds and sold them as a package. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> finally and so that went over you know fairly well considering you know it was a late kickoff we didn't do a ton of 
promotion, you know, try to the marketing part. We just wanted to get put together, you know, get the bones put together and get it out there. So, you know, it's like we've got a couple of public places that are going to be doing it, and that is their intent. So we'll be going and we'll doing workshops with them, you know, when they install it to, you know, how to install it, how to use the food. So it'll it'll develop that educational programming as well as the Fruit Tree Guild. So, you know, um, the Theosophical Society, there's another church, um, and there's somebody who is probably going to be putting one in a school. So there's, you know, the impact that they're going to have is going to be, you know, broad. And this week, we're put installing two Fruit Tree Guilds uh, within the city of Naperville. So one is going to be at the Naperville Community Gardens, which is managed by the Naperville Park District. Mm. Uh, that's going in tomorrow and th all in with volunteers. And then on Saturday, Jody and volunteers will be installing a fruit tree guild in front of the municipal center in their planter. It's a, how big is that planter? 10 by 20. 10 by 20 foot. Perfect fruit tree guild size. <laughs> yeah, they have been planned right at the entrance to mm. our city hall, basically. Cool. Yeah, and then we also are going to be part of a, a smart park. So it's a park that's does, that will be uh, solar powered, an outdoor meeting park for people to be hosting meetings or doing laptop work or plug in their cell phones or whatever, but mm -hmm. it's all solar powered. Um, and it's right outside the, our city hall along the river. Um, and we're, we've been given um, the latitude to be able to add uh, the to permaculturize it. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna make it into, you know, we can't, we don't have the des luxury of designing the whole landscape plan right. for it. But um, the landscape people who are doing it have invited us to participate in the process and make suggestions and have, we will have a, at least one, maybe more fruit tree guilds within the landscaping mm. uh, with signage as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah. all of these things are also having educational signage so people will always have that information. Super important. Yeah. So yeah, another thing that's manifested recently um, is the opportunity to work with potentially a couple of different uh, engineering firms. Mm. So you probably are, you've probably heard of this, Milton, but there's a big push in Chicago to do these uh, green corridors, mm -hmm. which are water management. Uh, the biggest reason for doing them is to do water management strategies and so in Chicago, they're incorporating permaculture into these sites. Mm. So they're putting forest gardens in, you know, they're putting edibles in as part of the water management strategy. That's so great. we're going to be getting involved with some of that, and um, which is going to be critical. And I think that's a really good way to really expand the impact and the knowledge um, and the understanding of what permaculture is. Um, and how it can, how it's supposed to work. You know, it's like you're supposed to like take the problems of one thing and make it a solution to another. So it's like, it's really gonna be a great opportunity to, you know, incorporate that philosophy and that principle. Um, so yeah, that's the other thing that's, I've learned a lot in doing this work here in suburbia is permaculture has a vocabulary problem. So much of what is going on, it's like you have to learn to speak the language of the culture that you exist in. And the culture that we live in here in suburbia, it's city planner, you have to use city planner, city planner language. So it's being able to effectively translate what we're doing in permaculture into what they're doing as city planners. So, so, you know, green green infrastructure, stormwater management, you yeah. know, all those types of things. Yeah, well, I'd like to throw out a few. I think that'd be interesting to a little juice. Like, what, what's, some, what's some of the ones that surprised you or uh, have you found useful terms? Well, the biggest one right now is obviously the stormwater management. Mm. Because, you know, stormwater management is huge here in suburbia. You know, it's a problem for everybody, uh, for all communities. So being able to tie in 
you know, growing food with, okay, this is a problem. So, you know, incorporate your rain gardens. You know, if you're doing a rain garden, why not throw some edibles in there? <laughs> you know, it's like, so build on what's already existing. So right now people are just starting to understand the concept of, you know, saving the pollinators. So installing native plantings. So people are just now getting the understanding of installing natives. Um, you know, that's in the realm of a lot of landscaping company, you know, vocabulary, but that's just recent. That's been yeah. over the past three years that's developed. So now it's like just getting them to take that next step and say, okay, great. Let's feed, you know, let's take care of the birds and the bees and the butterflies, but why don't we take care of us as people, you know, as the next step as well, because that's the key thing that's missing. It's still setting up that paradigm that we are separate from nature. So the more we can incorporate things for us as people, you know, it helps bridge that gap and that understanding that mm -hmm. we are part of the natural ecosystem too. And until we meet our needs as locally and within our own ecosystems as much as we can, you know, that's what's causing the problems is because we've, you know, separated ourselves. Mm. B, B, it makes us more resilient and more connected to the the spaces around us, and then we're dependent upon them, and we care about them more. And then how we affect them is is uh, how we interact with them has changed, right? Exactly, exactly. And then energy is another big thing right now. You know, um, so talking about energy and how can we. Uh, get more of our energy from renewable sources, make it affordable, mm -hmm. make it available to more people. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that's something that, you know, I was doing for what, 11 years or something <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, permaculture. And then now, now that Jody's, I'm in Asheville and Jody's still in Illinois, you know, she's been, she's been uh, working a lot on it because we had some new legislation yeah. that passed in Illinois. Um, that is enabling more entities to be involved um, and to receive more funding um, mm. to, to, to make solar happen. But, but that's a really big movement where we have to use permaculture knowledge and um, to be able to communicate to people why this is valuable. It's not just about um, kind of Oh, let's green this. Let's because this is a marketing thing, um, which a lot of businesses would do. You know, install a few panels, and this is hey, we get our solar powered. It's like yeah, maybe one percent of your energy. <laughs> um, but recognize that this is a way for us to be energy independent. That this is an opportunity for us to not pollute the environment while we're using energy that we don't necessarily, people always think of renewable energy or going green as they're having to give things up. And, you know, we really want to convey that you can have abundance. There's no reason you can't have abundance. It's all, again, how you plan, you know? So you just need to plan for what it is you want, and then you can create that. And there's no reason we can't still use all of the, if you still want to have every appliance that you have, then it just means you have to spend more money on renewable energy. <laughs> so, but it doesn't mean you have to get rid of anything. You right. just, you know, have to have more. Um, yeah. So, so I think trying to get people over that hump of thinking that uh, they have to give up things in order to be environmental you know uh, or to support this work and that doesn't need to be that in that place unfortunately you know solar renewable energy is still a little bit cost prohibitive for people to um have on their homes and, and things like that and until policy and that's another area i mean where permaculture activists could really do some benefit and that is doing some more advocacy work where we recognize what's going on in each of our communities, whether it's a local advocacy or it's statewide or even national, but what can we be doing to affect policy that can drive permaculture work further, mm -hmm. right? 
So if we had where stormwater management had to include um, swales with rain gardens, with you know, fr uh, fruit tree guilds or something like that, we had policy that said that they stipulated that they had to have X, Y, and Z, that would really move the movement forward, right? And if we had policies that really promoted renewable energy and educated people on how to go off grid or things like that, right? But yeah, so we need a little bit more kind of advocacy power to be able to move that forward. And, you know, Jody's been partnering a lot with Sierra Club um, to kind of get that messaging out there because they do that work. And then we have ELPC in Illinois. We have a few um, groups in Illinois who kind of move that forward, but it's a slow process, but it's a necessary process. So, yeah, and on that note, what's been actually evolving and where I'm finding myself going in order to make that impact and use the language and, you know, get people able to have a conversation and start to understand these things. Um, where what permaculture is essentially is, you know, we find the relationships because that's what is the key to where the energy is flowing in the system and the where and how the things connect. And so here in our environment, our relationships are between organizations and between people. So it's all about creating collaborations. So it's like trying to figure out how to create those collaborative efforts that are going to be able to, you know, make the most impact. And again, like you said, synergize, you know, this progress and this movement forward. So I've been doing a lot of more research into um, collective impact work. Uh, which is, it's essentially permaculture work. It's what we're doing, but, you know, collective impact focuses on those relationships. So again, it's that whole vocabulary language translation mm -hmm. concept. Um, <clears throat> so it's like learning how to create and, you know, put those things together. So it's, I've started a collaboration here in DuPage County that is focused on the energy, you know, and, increasing renewable energy. So there's a bunch of organizations, so we're pulling together a bunch of organizations to work together on this. Mm -hmm. And then, um, like Michelle said, we got involved with this food coalition that our local food pantry here initiated. So we're like, yes, absolutely. <laughs> and um, there's also, you know, the beginnings of a nature connection collaboration here. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're working with the forest preserves and, you know, trying to bring in hospitals and, you know, all these different organizations, you know, conservation organizations mm -hmm. to work together to solidify the messaging so that the messaging can get out there and be more effective and impact more people. So it's collaboration building. <laughs> Coalitions, collaborations. Yeah. Which is, you know, a huge part of permaculture, right? It's all about networking, collaborating, working together, finding out, okay, you're good at this, you're good at this, let's let's all put all this together. Unfortunately, you know, our communities have tended to be a little bit more on the competitive side, right? right? And wanting, you know, you have businesses and organizations kind of wanting to have their own niche and say that they're the best at this. And uh, so forging collaboratives has had some challenges and, mm -hmm. you know, Right now, we've had a win with DuPage Forest Preserve, so we're like, yeah, but a loss with the park district. <laughs> right. um, you know, so we're having some wins and losses, but we hope that with more wins. It hasn't been a loss yet, so well, it's just it's slow. A partial, it's a partial loss. Yeah. But when we get more wins, right, that those losses hopefully will see you know mm -hmm. how these other collaborations that we've forged have been beneficial for everyone right and that they then who are a little reluctant to begin to to collaborate will then see that positive benefit and want to join and again that's the whole idea of creating something new for people to glom onto for people to join that's different from what is presently there. Mm -hmm. And it, it's very challenging sometimes because we're always having to forge the new path, right? 
Um, and you know that forging a new path is a lot of energy. It's a lot of, you know, work, mental, physical. It's just very demanding. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but forging those new paths, we believe, is really the way forward. It's, it's really the way to move people, transition people um, hmm. to a permaculture life. Cool. <laughs> yeah, we live in, I mean, we live and work this constantly. This is our every breath. Every breath. <laughs> it is our every breath. It is how we see the entire world. And it's how we live our life and go about our day. Um, it, yeah, it, it's what moves us every day. And That's... we want other people to be as passionate about it as we are. <laughs> <laughs> they will be. Eventually. <laughs> So yeah, that's why we keep telling them to go to Midwest Permaculture. I'm like, it's yeah. not that far away. Nope. You know, I'm like, just go do it. <laughs> yeah, and I'm yeah. trying to figure out, I mean, we've, we've been out of, right, the actual PDC for a while. I mean, we did host two at the Resiliency Institute. And it's like, is there a way to, you know, and, and then Jody started her Permaculture Forest Gardener class because what we were discovering is that PDC isn't for everyone. It's kind of big. It's big. But, yeah, anyway. I mean, if you're into philosophy, right? You know, if you're into philosophy, I think the PDC is awesome, right? Right. If you can grapple with philosophy, take it. But for most suburban people, they really need one piece at a time. So. Right. They might need just to really understand all the principles, the ethics and the principles and techniques and strategies as they relate to landscape, as they relate to lifestyle, right? So like separate pods. And that's why we have our permaculture forest gardener course, because then that enables them to learn the learn permaculture, but in the framework of just the landscape. In, in a context. Yes. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, is, 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 is that a big thing? Uh, I mean, is that is that your? How do I say? It? Is that is this? Uh, what should what should we talk about? The things that you're doing, like the forest gardener class. Um, well, I'll send you the of the highlights of what we're doing, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the permaculture forest gardener yeah. series. We have three courses that are nine to ten months long. Okay. Yeah. So three courses. These are nine to ten month courses. They do it one uh, day a month, one day a month. So we make it. We found that that's the most approachable way for the suburbanite to learn something new. Mm -hmm. Is we tried many different ways, <laughs> and this has been the most effective. Mm -hmm. One day a month, they come, spend the day, they learn, um, and then they have homework. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, they come back to the next class, they might have an exam to take, whatever it is. But so, you know, it's that process. Uh, we do the edible wild plants. So they learn over 200 edible wild plants. They learn how to identify them, to find them in the wild. They learn how to prepare foods from them. Um, they share foods from them. They get a recipe book at the end of all the recipes that were made in the forest. Mm. Um, so it's all about, I going out in the wild, well, in our forest preserves, as wild as you get, right? Um, and Abandoned really, lots, yeah. <laughs> how to identify these plants and forage for them, right? Uh, and then we do our bioregional herb herbalism. So what are the plants that are here in our bioregion that we can use to heal ourselves, to mm -hmm. nourish ourselves? So our primary focus is not on healing ailments but rather on nourishing and preventative right. so how do we use the plants in our surroundings to nourish us and maintain our health um, on a regular basis so incorporating herbs into your daily diet through infusions through tinctures through just adding them to your food um, and then also we teach them obviously remedy making for when you do get sick or you know, have injuries yep. or something like that. So they also learn that. And they, 
A big part of that, both classes incorporate walks. Mm. So there are two, one and a half hour plant walks on the edible wild plants. And then she incorporates a few different ways, but they're probably out there for an hour and a half with herbalism, where they're learning to connect with plants, with herbalism specifically, of sitting, just sitting with plants, maybe mm. a half an hour every day, every time they come to class, they just sit with plants. And it's how, what's that plant speaking to you? It doesn't have to be in language, but do you feel an energetic connection? Can you feel what it might be good for? You know, how do we connect with plants on a energetic level, on a different level than what we're used to? Instead of her just giving you information, here's this plant and it's good for this, rather, how can you learn from that plant directly, you know, without an instructor? Mm -hmm. uh, because then that way, when they're done with that course, they can then go into the environment and learn how to just spend time with new plants that they haven't ex learned about yet and see if those plants can really communicate with them and tell them what they're good for. And then we have our permaculture forest gardener class, with, which Jody teaches. Um, and Jody, maybe you want to tell a little bit about what your goals are with that course. So that's essentially getting them to understand the whole framework, the principles of permaculture and getting them to understand that, yes, we're going to be applying this to your personal landscaping and you're going to be learning how to apply it, but there are tools. So actually getting people to understand that there is a method to the madness right. and we actually go through the design process over the course of eight months. Mm. So each step you're learning, you know, a new principle, um, for each class, we focus on a different principle and then how that's incorporated. And we use our forest garden there at the farm mm -hmm. to demonstrate and show them and give them some hands-on experience as to, you know, how to use each principle. So, you know, whether it's, you know, value the marginal or, you know, so, you know, we've got an herb spiral there. We've got keyhole gardens. You know, we've got swales. We've got hula culture beds. You know, it's like we've got all these resources right there within our forest garden. So it's like yeah. people can actually see how to do it in their homes. And then we do some sort of hands-on skill while we're there as well. So whether it's making a quick, you know, tincture or, yeah, a little mini hula culture bed so that they understand the concept, so that it gets them over that hump. That's what – a lot of people need is just that extra hand holding to get them willing to, you know, dig that swale and, you know, connect that gutter to the rain garden, you know, make a rain garden and make that connection. It's just, they just need that little bit of extra confidence boosting. Um, so hopefully by teaching them, you know, the, the tools, you know, of the principles, um, as well as, you know, some of the strategies and techniques mm -hmm. that it gets them comfortable and willing to go home and experiment and, you know, try some things. Yeah, I, I see that a lot too. It's it's that, it's that how, how do you get people to go home and start doing something, right? You just you just gotta you, you gotta bend those barriers a little bit, right? So that, oh, they can see and then they can see that it's not this like you have to do it exactly this way or else you're you just done. It's like exactly. it's a process and you're you're learning throughout it and you try something and then you, and then you get feedback. And you're like, well, next time I'm not going to do that. And then, exactly. You know. Yes. So, and I think a lot of it too helps because I can point out, you know, things that we have done in our gardens that, you know, were those learning opportunities. <laughs> 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 yes. And so, you know, that really helps people feel comfortable. So, and it's like, it's some, oh, you know, it's like you can literally see them when I show them things. You know, it's like this relief that comes over them like, Oh, it's okay. I can go back and then I can fix it. You know, if I yeah. can redo it, it's not a permanent thing. Right. Like our fruit tree guild class. We've been teaching a fruit tree killed class since the beginning. Right. And <clears throat> people have taken it three times mm -hmm. and still don't have a fruit tree guild in their yard. <laughs> and so that's why, like, we were saying we have to just sell the damn fruit tree guild. <laughs> it's just too much for people yep. to understand, right? It's even, I mean, you really think about a fruit tree guild. It is a lot to know. It's a lot to learn. And even though we give them 
all the different lists of the plants and we give them how to kind of put oh. it together. And oh, all I might do it wrong. I might do it wrong. I can't. I, I yeah. can't. I know. I know. So finally selling the fruit tree guilds were like, yes, <laughs> that was, that's really where we needed to move to. Um, and we feel like we even need to go further. So next mm -hmm. year it's all about, or even in the fall, if we can get our stuff together, um, you know, of creating the program where we actually have an educational process. So you buy the fruit tree guild, but with it, you're also getting education and assistance. Right. You know? So it's we'll go like, out there, we'll help evaluate the site so right. that you feel secure about where you're planning to put it, you know, so, you know, there'll be some of this hand holding that'll happen in that process. And we feel like if we can get fruit tree guilds, so we're doing them in these public places and we're inviting the public to come watch and learn, right? Um, that that'll help build the confidence, but if we can get them in neighborhoods, get having people have them in their front yards and having that exposure of it, then that welcomes, invites more people to do it, right? Mm -hmm. Makes them feel more comfortable with the concept. Yeah, they have no exposure to this kind of stuff, right? It's like a, a guild, what? what what's exactly. That? Yeah. But if so. they're gardeners already, that's a help because we just yes. say companion planting. A guild right. is really just companion planting. We're just talking about using perennials instead of annuals for, for that. I mean, that's really all you're doing is just making right. a shift from some annuals to some perennials. And if you want to throw some annuals in there, you go right ahead. <laughs> yep. Uh, one, one of the things that, that I've been talking about in my circles is, uh, you know how they have, they say there's like the 80, 20 of doers and followers. Yeah. Right. I the, didn't the know follow. it was that high. Oh, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> well, and so we're doing this cooperative thing and we're like, well, we, I think we want the opposite. We want 80% doers yeah. and the 20% <laughs> followers. And, and then with the 20%, we need to figure out how to unlock them. Right. What's, what's that thing to get them started, become a doer. You know, I think that's, that's one of the big things about uh, our culture is that we're not doers. We're, we're followers. It's the whole culture, you know, follow the culture, follow the, you know, get your job. Our educational system. Yeah. That's exactly. That's how we're raised for how many years? 18 hard, years. Hard, it's hard like, to undo that. Yeah. And, and, uh, but so, so we're optimistic that if we can get an 80, 20 doers, you know, 80% doers and 20% followers, and then we can unlock the followers as well to get them to do their, their own thing. But, but we can really get a group of people together that really makes stuff happen. Absolutely. I'm wondering so, about ages too, like, yeah. you know, if you think about, well, like we're older than you, Milton, you know, so so we're in our upper 40s. Well, ha, I'm ha, ha, ha. Well, one of you, one of us is. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like when you're at the different ages, I'm so curious how that manifests. Yeah. You, you know, are 30 year olds more into doing, less into following, a 20 year old? You know, I'm just, I'm, I think that'd be a little interesting because we are seeing shifts, right? With yeah. different ages. Um, uh, life stages too. Like, you know, when I became a father, you know, that, that exactly. changed the whole dynamic of everything, right? Yes. Uh, um, versus when I had extra time to do whatever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> where, where did that go? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And time, that's a big thing that is always such a challenge to get people to recognize that time is a human construct and, you know, you get to choose how it, it gets spent and, and what do you really value and how do you really want to be using the time that you have? And, well, and making, really, making... Are you doing carpool constantly? Is that really how you want to be spending your time? Is it really valuable? Does your kid, is your kid really going to be a major league baseball player? You know? <laughs> right. Well, and, and, and even setting that time so that it's an advantage, yeah. right? Your food forests, the more time that they accrue, the better they become. Right, and that's that 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 you've created something where time is an advantage. 
Right. Whereas, whereas you know, when you when you're doing that, oh, we got to beat the clock. We got to, you know, thirty more days until the course makes or breaks. Like, oh, that's the worst. And that's, yeah, yes, that's, that's not the way to, to run things if you can help it. Right. You know? Exactly. So yeah, <laughs> that's Which why we're launching our yeah. 2019 course registration this week. Exactly. <laughs> Isn't that insane? No, but that's 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 good. That's that's uh, gosh, that's that's a year and a half at least, right? When, when is no, it? No, no, no. Uh, a year. A little, a little less than a year. Just less a than a year. Bit. Yeah. Less than a year. Okay. Yeah, like so, ten months. So that's ten a, that's... months advance. You have ten months advance notice. <laughs> If only that were enough. <laughs> You're behind. Yeah, it's like trying to figure out what that switch is to get people from, you know, thinking to doing, you know? Yeah. Well, because that's where the Shin and Yoko comes in, because it's like it gets people out of their heads and this right. constant analysis paralysis and, yep. you know, gets you into that more doing vibe. Well, and uh, analysis through doing. Right? Yes. Like, like you can, okay, I don't, I don't know what's exactly. going on. I have no idea, but I can do something and then, and then respond to that feedback and like, Oh, okay. And then you, you figure out what to do next. It's like, what's the next right thing to do? Right. What's the next yeah. thing to do and figure it out and then do it. So. Well, and why don't more people, I guess if you have gardened, you know, you have this experience and so really getting people into growing something what just popped in my head was the fact that typically in our culture women have been the growers the cultivators right mm -hmm. and there's so much reward in that i mean just planting a seed and watching that seedling erupt from the soil right like it's like oh you get so excited <laughs> and men have been the destroyers it's like they're the ones mowing the lawns doing the weed whacker thing you right. know what i mean the snowblower right like they're always kind of the destroyers <laughs> and yeah. kind of doing this culture shift right where we can get men more involved with getting their hands into growing you know what i mean or or cultivating something it doesn't have to be plants right but how can you grow something how can you cultivate something how can you plant a seed whether it's a thought a plant uh, a project you know but yeah. how can you get more people and especially men especially men seriously we really need to target men into getting involved and feeling that reward of yeah. doing and growing yeah men women get it because they're nurturers by nature you know like women get this stuff. They don't always have the time to do it, but men aren't getting it yet. They're slower to, to take this on. And I would like to target men a little bit more. We, we are <laughs> slower, yes. <laughs> but that's a cultural thing. Yeah, no, no, it, it is. Be that weird way. It's just the way our culture has designed it. And so, you know, how do we, how do we get more men involved in this process? Unless if we just are just we run all by women, <laughs> which is fine with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think this is an important thing to show, like what's on the other side of a PDC? You, know, you take yes. it and, and what can you, where can you take that, that experience that you've had uh, and and go with it. Well, we exactly. need more people to do what we're doing. So we need more PDC people to do this <laughs> work. Yeah. <laughs> because if we don't transition our communities, then I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, I'm really excited. I haven't dug into it yet, but uh, Holmgren's new book. If you guys, <laughs> uh, Retro Suburbia. <laughs> I think I watched a video talking about that. It's a big, it's a big old tome. Uh, his new, his new book, and it's it's kind of talking about uh, permaculture in the in the community. Like, how do you retrofit the right. suburbs, essentially? Oh yeah. Um, no, I haven't seen that yet. Yeah, I, the Downshifters I, I Guide to a Resilient Future. Retrosuburbia.com. 
Retro Suburbia, yeah. RetroSuburbia.com. Yep. And they like self published it. So it, it uh, you know, did they're kind of crowdfunded publishing it. Um, and it's it's just a case say this. So this is for uh, Australia. I, uh, I didn't catch exactly where he did it. Uh, you know, uh, Sydney or Melbourne or whatever. Um, and so, so you might have to kind of sh shift some of the things, yeah. you know, Australian culture to, to American culture. But well, um, and he's been talking about this for a while because I've yeah. seen videos, yeah, of this like for five years ago or something, right? Um, so this has been quite a process for him to, Indeed. yeah, get this unfolded because they were doing kind of different properties, like this property is doing permaculture this one isn't and this one's doing this the stuff and they were showing what's happening on each property as a result mm. of doing mm. permaculture and non-integrated permaculture so mm. uh, he was doing some kind of case studies you know to, to really educate people yeah interesting i will thank you for those resources yeah. yes give me more shit to do <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> The reading list is is ever growing, and and the time to to read it is actually ever shrinking. Well, yeah. And and now I'm having to learn wildflowers in North Carolina. Right? Yes. Yeah. So I'm having to learn a new ecosystem. Yeah. You know, yeah. And all the different things that are going on here. But like, what's um, uh, what how what's the scene like in Nashville? What's what like in Nashville? The scene, the permaculture oh. scene. Yeah, interesting. So, um, people here, like almost everybody knows about it. Yeah. Okay. So that's one big difference. Most people around that you just talk to know what permaculture is. People are connected to food a little bit more still. You know, we have a larger number of people who are foraging, much larger number of people who are foraging. Um, but, you know, you're still going to have a lot of people who are just grocery stores, right? It's the population. So the problem is, is that in Asheville, most of the people who live here are not from here, mm. right? So they've moved here because it's the place to be, right? And they're moving from all over Um and so those people are carrying, bringing with them those bad habits of kind of suburbia. But the people who've been here for a long time, not just locals, but then also just people who moved here and who've lived here for more than 10 years, yeah, they're, they get it. And so they, there are some edible parks here, but they're faced with a lot of challenges. Um, they don't really manage and maintain them. So that's been something that they're now working on how to manage and maintain them, mm -hmm. how to grow them. The bureaucracy in Asheville has been a little bit challenging um, to, to really kind of get more going. But Edible Parks is something that a lot of organizations want more of in the community. Mm. There are a lot. I have gone to so many parks just to like investigate, you know, and check out parks. And there are edible plantings everywhere. Behind the food co-op in West Asheville, which is very urban, there's plantings of fig trees and apple trees and service berries and elderberries and raspberries and blueberries. I mean, there's plantings of that. I went to another park, a baseball field with filled with, with trees, that mm. fruit trees that have been planted there and shrubs and things like that. So they don't do the gilding. Mm -hmm. they, they're really just putting in some trees and some shrubs that are edible. And then, but there's so much native abundance. So I can go forage anywhere and find nettles and uh, knotweed and wood nettles or dead nettles, sorry. And uh, garlic mustard, of course, and money plants and, you know, all these different plants that I can be eating. Those are everywhere. I just found a lamb's quarters. I found peppermint. I found spearmint. I'm just yep. like, okay, I'm finding more and more and more. It's spring. <laughs> Here it comes. Oh my gosh. Spring started Valentine's Day. Really? Yeah. Wow. Spring started Valentine's Day and it's still going. It's crazy. 
it's crazy. It's the longest spring I've ever had, ever. Um, and we've had quite the fluctuation. I mean, we yeah. could go 40 degrees in a day hmm. um, with weather. So I, we had 90 degrees and then we went down to 50. <laughs> 90, wow. Yeah, we had a 90 degree day just last week. Um, it's probably so when I, we had our 70 degree. It's probably the same system that was moving up. Exactly, exactly, sure. exactly. But anyway, people here, I have not met an unfriendly person yet. Mm. Oh my gosh, everyone's friendly. You must plan 20 to 30 minutes extra for every errand. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I am not kidding. Because I walk out the door and I get a neighbor stopping me and wanting to chat and they don't just, hi, how are you? Uh-uh, it's like conversation. <laughs> At the grocery store, you just say, oh, you know, I was looking for the granola and they're like, oh, you know, and they give you the uh, like a 20 minute thing <laughs> about <a> granola. <laughs> so very happy, super friendly mm. people. The economy here sucks. Does it? Yeah. Like you, the, the wages that people get paid around here are pathetic. Hmm. You, you cannot live if you work a job in Ash. I mean, it'd be very hard to work a job in Asheville and have a lifestyle. Most hmm. people who work, like they say, it's bring your own job when you come here. Oh. So it's kind of having a remote job. Right, the mm -hmm. idea that you have a remote job, you work from a home office, whatever, something like that. Um, so that's been very frustrating. I think I don't like that a community supports that. Right, that makes it have a bit of a sour taste in my mouth. Mm -hmm. um, but if you love beer, wine, local food, and foraged food, then this is a place to definitely vacation. I don't know that I would honestly recommend people living here. Mm. Um, but I think it's a great place to visit for all of those things to really just immerse yourself in that experience. Yeah. Cool. I'm enjoying the weather much more than being in Chicago. <laughs> yeah. My peaches are not even blooming yet. Yeah. Oh my gosh, like all the plants, all the trees have bloomed already. It's, I mean... Standing under the weeping cherries. Oh, it's just been crazy. And I'm still waiting for that here, too. The bloom. No leaves. And you're <sighs> even further away than Chicago. I mean, right? Are you time-wise, or are you along the same timeline? Uh, well, I'm, I'm uh, east, I mean, eastern time zone. But uh, no, I meant, um, uh, I'm, I'm due late. west. Due west of uh, Chicago. Yeah. So about a day, the, all the way that they get, we get about a day later. A day later. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and how are things going? Like, what are you? You got two kids now, right? Uh, yeah, I got two kids. Um, and uh, so like, now three and one or four and two? Uh, five and two. Five and two. Yeah, Oscar and Emmett. Um, and I, I've. Uh, so I was telling Jody, I, I'm a co-manager of a cooperative at a, an addiction treatment facility, and we manage the land. They've got 64 acres that we try to stack as many people uh, into as possible. So you know, if you, you need land, come come on out and be a part of the cooperative, and you can you know carve out your garden or make a little your own fruit forest or you know oh, really? yeah. Uh, we've got a, a shepherd out there that's got like a, you know, mow, mow your lawn, flock of sheep. They'll, she'll bring them to various places. Oh, um, I love that. And that's fantastic. Had 14 lambs this year. Oh. Um, and uh, yeah, and then I, I have a friend that I'm helping with her kind of homestead, Pollywog Farm, and growing, I grow a lot of microgreens. Oh. So I've gotten good at that. And the nice thing is, if you mess up, you don't have to wait till next year for your garden. Yeah. <laughs> you just start them again in another another nine days. Are you doing them in greenhouses or? Um, it's a or? it's a greenhouse built on the side of her house. Okay. And she has so it's like on the on the basement, the walkout basement, and uh, they got a super efficient um, furnace, so they just open the window, oh. and it heats the greenhouse. Oh wow! And then. Uh, so they're actually getting natural sunlight. That's what I'm yep. asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes. Yeah. 
yeah, for the most part, there's a few greens that just can't take the cold. Um, and things, things slow down, but you just, you just go with it, you know? And then, um, still working with Midwest, Midwest permaculture, obviously. Yeah. And, uh, uh, just trying to do my own thing too. Right. Like, um, just, uh, I bought a new house, uh, in, yeah. in February. Um, yeah. and, uh, so figuring out how to, how to deal with the yard. It, it came with a fig tree and gooseberries and and raspberries and currants and and uh cherries and plums and and a little garden so uh it's oh full goodness. of walking onions i think oh my goodness. <laughs> wow yeah and you, you know how to propagate right like you oh can yeah that yeah okay. oh yeah well i have i mean I, I'm, I'm waiting to see what comes up first yeah right? let's just see, yeah, see all the stuff but you know yeah, right sorry. and there's experience it but although i i uh it's like very shaded they get a lot of big big trees and true trees so um uh i'm gonna start some pawpaws start some forest like some um thimbleberry some uh wild ginger kind of get that established in the yard um we got some persimmons to go in a slightly sunnier spot um and uh just kind of going from there See what trouble I can cause. Yeah. Oh, fun. I moved in February to this new house. So, wow, you've had a lot going on. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah. And then just, you know, just trying to, to figure out, figure out how to get people to do stuff, you know, come play, come, how, how do you, you know, how do you break down those barriers to just getting started? You know, to, to, I tell people fail spectacularly. Right? Uh, was I saying that at your courses? Yeah. Fail, fail spectacularly. Like, you just got to go and, you know, sometimes you'll be spectacular and then sometimes and then you'll know how to fail spectacularly too and it'll be okay. And, you, you know, you, and, you, and then next time you'll do it better and you won't fail at, quite as spectacularly, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have some pictures of all the thistle growing at Fairy Forest Garden. <laughs> oh, yeah. <sighs> Yeah. Thistle or, or teasel? Thistle. Is it thistle? Yes. Canadian thistle. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh boy. We yeah. we we have it in groves. And it's starting to come up right now. Yeah. It needs to get pulled. Yeah, it's about this big right now. Yeah. Oh, we gotta pull it, pull it, pull it. Yeah, we, we, we had uh in the garden at the at the farm. Uh, South Thistle has come up. Oh yeah, we got that too. Yeah, that one's a good one too. It yeah, hurts. And they all hurt when you touch you touch them and you try to pull them out. They're like, yeah, you know, don't no. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and get those leather gloves, man. You got to get those. Yeah, leather gloves. Uh, they don't even they don't even quite. I mean, you still get prickled a little bit. And then the the quack grass. Have you guys ever <gasps> quack grass? Oh, don't, don't even, even say that word. Ah, yes. The bane of our existence. So yeah, yeah those, those like, three things actually, yes. You have a mm -hmm. permaculture uh, worst experience. <laughs> Just like, what are all the tragedies that we've had to face? You know, what are our worst nightmares? Yeah. <laughs> that's all. That's all. Well, that, that's there's right. A, there's a, a food forest. When I first moved here, it's about eight blocks away uh, ah. that was put in. But they all they did is they put in the overstory trees and they yeah. didn't do a lick. They like, you know, put in cardboard and wood mulch over the top of it. And the quack grass just, you know, one year later, boom. Just said all... thank you. That was yeah. delicious. Yeah. That's yeah. what I yeah. exactly That's what we, we had. We experienced that. Yep. Yeah. We yeah. did it for two years. So yeah. yeah, we're talking two foot deep sheet mulch. Just said thank you. Yeah. It grows right <laughs> through it. Yeah. Eats yeah. it right up. Yep. <laughs> We're like, let's just keep smothering it. Let's just keep smothering it. Yeah, no, that doesn't work. No, it put something work. else in. Uh, you know, like, look, look at what. I planted peppermint. I'm hoping so. Oh, last, yeah. So in the fall, I planted peppermint, and I'm hoping peppermint can take it over. Yeah, we're trying strawberries, lemon balm, and peppermint and spearmint to outcompete. Yeah. I've I've seen the the peppermint do a good job. I've seen um, the spearmint kind of, it grows 
together somehow the way the experiment grows. Oh. Uh, um, so like there's it's grass not coming spreading. up. Hmm? It's not as spreading as the peppermint. It or, is, or but it's dense. got a different root structure. Yeah, it's um, not as dense as, as the peppermint. So the grass can kind of have space still to get in there. Um, uh, yeah, I've seen, um, uh, we had a patch of thimble berries. No, 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 wait, that's what I said before. Pe peachy berries, they're like a, a ground cherry. And they beat out the grass. So they held the space against the grass. I've seen um, cleavers hold the space against the grass. Really? I've seen, yeah, a um, little patch of cleavers and there's no grass mm. around it. So just looking looking for those things that that can compete, you know. Um, uh, I did some buckwheat and actually, uh, what's the morning glory came and just pulled it all down. Oh yeah, Mind bind weed. Yes, we got our bind weed at the farm too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we, we we have we have the wild stuff and the cultivated stuff. Like Oh nice. Yeah, it's all it's all there. <laughs> it's a mess. We did use horticulture vinegar that did work on the bind weed. Oh really? Yeah. That's the twenty percent stuff? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And then we did um the black. Didn't do black. anything. Yeah. Yeah, we tried that. And that's really been helpful for the grass. Yeah. That's fantastic. So is the sheet metal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we yeah. resorted to quite a few things. <laughs> yeah. And the poison ivy, we've been successful. Poison ivy was... Uh, we use the vinegar on the poison ivy, too. Yeah. Okay. So I hand-pulled a ton of it. Right? Yeah. I went in there, we dug it out, we pulled it. Um, for two years, we were just really yanking and making sure it didn't really grow. Mm. And then um, Dennis, our manager there, he did all that vinegar and it's good. Cool. I'll remember that one. Yeah. So you just got to just pull it all out and dig the roots as much as you can. And then with any little sprouts, you got a vinegar. Oh. <laughs> As it's soon as that, they come up, yes. That's the biggest key is um, never letting anything get really more than five inches. You yeah. Know what I mean? Yeah. Always, always making sure that the root never has an opportunity to nur get nourished. Right. Which is one of those advantages of having a small project and those small, <laughs> slow solutions. Yeah. Because the bigger your project, the harder it is to manage. Yeah, we, so. Right now, like with fairy, the size of Fairy Forest Garden, you know, I, I think we had seven volunteers one day. Now the weather was horrible. It rained, snowed, and sleeted the, <laughs> while we were doing all of this. <laughs> we couldn't finish the whole with seven people. We yeah. couldn't. Mm -hmm. Do it you know what i mean it was it's too big we really need like 20 25 people to tackle that that area um and that's a lot of people that to try to get on kind of a regular basis yeah because you have to do it and then maybe one to one and a half weeks later you gotta do it again yeah you know? so yeah all right well, we'll let you go that's awesome talking to you yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's good to see and you both do you put yeah. these videos on YouTube, Milton? I do, yeah. Okay, so you know you should make a short one for those with ADD, and then you should make them at least 10 minutes long. I mean, you know the 10-minute rule with YouTube, right? No. No. So if the key to getting, like, ads and all that kind of stuff on YouTube to get paid uh. is if you can get people to watch for 10 minutes. That's how you maximize your payout and your, you know, like your, yeah. your YouTube analytics is okay, 10 okay. minutes. So you should have both versions. So um, well, that, that's, the, that's the plan that we'll have the full thing kind of mostly unedited. And then I'll have like the little short teaser. Yeah, but it's only got to be 10 minutes because after 10 minutes, you know, it's like 10 minutes is the maximum is the maximized. Uh, point so, so edit the long version to 10 minutes yeah this is what she's saying I yes. hear you. i'm not gonna do that one but and, and then you can make a little money to pay right. for time. 
I, I don't so, okay, know. my son did it. So when he was 11 and he monetized his and he made, you know, it was like probably up to $4,000, I want to say. Wow. So, and then he like stopped, you know, getting the views and they just now cut him off. So, I mean, it's definitely worth looking into. If you're going through all this work to actually get them up on YouTube and get them nice videos like this, it's totally worth looking into monetizing it. All right. Well, I mean, it's it's mostly for boo is permaculture. So that's the, the YouTube is just auxiliary, right? It's just out there. But uh, but that's a potential revenue stream. One that's been our to do list since we've started as well. Uh, that we don't have the capacity to do. Principle obtain a yield is it yeah. So uh, it is. It is, and, and the yield is is getting to see both of you again and you know, <laughs> have a wonderful conversation. That's the yield that I'm looking for. Okay. Everything else, gravy, gravy, right? It's all, all right. It's all gravy. So. All right. Okay. Well, good talking to you, Milton. Yeah. Have a good Thank day. Thank you so much. Yep. Bye. Bye.